So we have the three shapes. You have to have the three shapes memorized. Have to know those. Not hard though, right? Bad shape, circle shape, spirilla looks like a spiral. Not a problem. But I wanted to show you, these are obviously, what shape are these? Um, Coxie. Coxie, right. And actually, I'm trying to show you here how small the bacteria are compared to, these are actually eukaryotic cells, but they would be Coxie if they were bacteria. But do you see how small the bacteria are compared to the uh, eukaryotic cells? You could probably get over two or 300 of those into a regular cell. They're much, much smaller than our cells. And that's why it's said that you probably have more bacterial cells in your body than you have cells of your own body. And that's because they're so small. And we do have a lot of cells, uh, bacteria. I, I'm going to give you a heads up here. Have you ever been around a street person? Street pre people like talking about somebody that lives on the street? Yeah. They don't smell real good, right? The reason they don't smell real good is because the bacteria on their skin. That's what makes us smell badly, is the bacteria on our skin. The reason we smell better when we shower is we're washing the bacteria off of our skin. It's the bacteria that smell. If you get sharp to this, you can start smelling pathogens. I can smell when one of our dogs has ear mites. I can smell it. I know what ear mites smell like. I can smell it. No, I'm serious. Saves you a trip to the vet, you know, and because uh, then I can take care of it. I know a bacteria called coccidia that can make your animal sick or kill a guinea pig because I've experienced that. I know what coccidia smells like. And I had one vet freak out when I came in and said, I can smell it, it's coccidia. And they checked, they go, it is coccidia. How did you know? I said, I told you, I can smell it. It's not that hard. If you know what it smells like, you know, it's pretty nasty. So um, they have differing characteristics and then they can help you to figure out what you're looking at. Now, let's see, for this test, you are going to need, we're going to get to that in a second. To this, for this test, you're going to need to be able to distinguish if a particular function wasn't happening, which part of the bacterium was not working correctly. And so uh, go ahead and look on page 41, and I'll give you an example. The On Your Own 2.1, it says, Two different species of bacteria attempt to infect an organism. One bacterium succeeds while the other is destroyed by the organism's infection fighting mechanisms. What is most likely the major difference between these two bacteria? Jacob's going to tell us. One is capsulated. Very good. One has a capsule and the other probably does not. Very good. This is how you're going to have to think to answer these questions. Can you kind of see why I liked micro though? Because to me this was like, oh, well if I know this I can answer these questions. And so that's what I'm talking about. Um, and then 2.2 a bacterium is poisoned by a substance that is allowed into the interior of the cell. What bacterial component did not do its job? What didn't do its job? Come on, everybody. Plasma membrane. Very good. The plasma membrane. That guy on the watchtower, he let something in it wasn't supposed to be in, right? Okay. Have you guys ever heard of a product called DMSO? Okay. They use it on horses. And that's how I knew about it. But then I was told that some athletes use it. Are any of you athletes? Yes? OK. It, ask sometime if they're, what they're using is DMSO. If you've got inflammation, they'll put DMSO on it. Well, the trick is DMSO tells your plasma membranes to not distinguish what's coming in or going out anymore, which can be very, very dangerous. So you have to be very careful if you use DMSO. But it's used to take down inflammation. Because I remember the first time I saw my husband slap it on a horse's leg, a racehorse's leg, back when we were dating. I looked at him and I go, you're using DMSO? And he goes, yeah, you know, it takes the inflammation down. And I go, but you're not using gloves. And he goes, why? I go, as soon as you touch this stuff, it makes anything you touch go through your plasma membranes and into your system. So if he went and touched the wrong thing right after that, it could kill him. And if you read the container, it says to use gloves, you know? Let's be honest, who reads the container? So anyway, so you got to be careful with that kind of stuff. Um, and then 2.3, if a bacterium cannot move, what structure is missing? Very good, the flagellum. And I told you, when you look at your, your cultures next week, if it's motoring across, you know that it's a flagellated bacterium. So that's good. Okay, then we get to the bacteria's eating habits. And bacteria come in decomposers, uh, producers, and, you know, they're everything, right? They come in all three, consumer, 
uh, producers and decomposers. So we know that it's a bacteria. We know it's Monera because it's a prokaryotic cell, right? That's actually how we know it's one of these guys. Now, it tells us here that most bacteria are saprophytes. And there's another word root here that you should be aware of. And it's not really going to apply to this chapter, but you're going to see it again. This word root, you should be writing down these word roots. Have like one little sheet that you keep word roots on. This word root means plant. That means plant, fight. Okay? And I know, you look at it and go, well, why are they attaching it to this chapter? Well, a saprophyte, back, they used to classify bacteria as plants. They got, yeah, I know. They, they've changed the classification systems. So, anyway, so a, fa a saprophyte is an organism that feeds on dead material. Well, see, because fungi used to be in plant A, too. So maybe they used this word with the fungi and just attributed it to the bacteria. But when I was in school, I remember fungi, we, we kept them with the uh, plant kingdom. Okay? So a saprophyte is something, basically think the saprophyte is a decomposer. Okay? It lives on dead matter and it's breaking it down. How important is that? Well, let's think for a minute here. If it wasn't for saprophytes, then everybody that ever died would still be laying around. They wouldn't have broken down. And all those nutrients wouldn't go back in the soil so that the nutrients were there for the plants so that when we eat them, we get the nutrients. That's pretty bad when you think about it. So it's a very important job that the saprophytes are able, the decomposers are able to break things down and put them back into the soil so that the plants have the nutrients that we need and we can go on. And it's also very important to me that like Julius Caesar's not still laying around. That would be really gross, right? So, okay, let me get my glasses. <laughs> Uh, let's see, on the next page, on page 42, some organisms live on living things. Remember, a saprophyte lives on dead material. If something lives on living material, what do we call it? Parasite. A parasite. Very good. Makes me think of mosquitoes, but I know they're not bacteria. But anyway, so parasites live on living things. And then we have autotrophic bacteria. They can be photosynthetic, <clears throat> excuse me, which means that they use light to make their food, but they can also be chemosynthetic, which means they use chemicals to make their food. And they actually use the energy that is given off from a chemical reaction and make their food from that energy. Pretty cool when you think about it. And the book goes on and tells us that there are certain byproducts. Well, the good part about chemosynthetic bacteria is they actually use chemicals that can't be used for anything else. And then they make usable byproducts out of it so that they're going back into the system and are able to be used. So it's really quite neat. So photosynthetic and chemosynthetic are both autotrophs. And you can kind of listen to the word and hear what they're using. Photosynthetic photo, they're light, chemosynthetic chemicals. Right? Okay. Um, then he tells us uh, that when things break down food, it's called digestion. Now, you guys know that. That's not hard. And then you've probably heard of aerobic exercise and anaerobic exercise. And some of you may have a solid idea of what that is. Like if you're out running long distances, you're doing aerobic exercise, or maybe you, you're working out doing aerobic exercise um, because you're taking up oxygen. Whereas if you're doing little tiny sprints or you're running up and down stairs, then you're doing anaerobic, okay? And so there's the difference. Aerobic means it's with oxygen and anaerobic means without oxygen. I just want you to know that. So aerobic organisms are organisms that can only live in the presence of oxygen. And anaerobes, anaerobic organisms, can only live where there is no oxygen. And I'm going to tell you right now, the anaerobes are the, probably the most dangerous bacteria, and they're also the stinkiest bacteria. It's kind of like God was kind to us, <clears throat> and he made those ones that don't need air to live where you can't smell them anyway. Okay? Uh, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> When I was in uh, micro lab one day, um, our micro lab, I'll never forget this, our micro lab was probably twice the size of this room. You could get 100 students in there because that's about how many students were in the class. I'm sitting at the very back. There's a kid sitting, well, there's, there's kids all over the place. So the professor, 
Professor Wilt tells us, now today we're working with a form of botulism. Botulism is an anaerobe. That's why you find it in canned food. And I'm sure your mom has told you before, never eat canned food from a can that's swollen. The reason is botulism is an anaerobe, so it lives where there's no oxygen. And when you see that the can is swollen, you know something is breathing in there. It's respirating, that's why the can is swollen, so you've got bacteria living in there. So that makes sense to everybody. Same reason a milk carton that's swollen, you know it's gone bad because it's respirating in there. Okay, so botulism does that. So he says, today we're working with botulism. Anybody that doesn't use perfect aseptic technique, which is what we were taught, perfect aseptic technique, he says, I will fail you today because he says, I don't want anybody to get sick. So you weren't allowed to touch your face or anything. You had to flame everything. Everything had to be done perfectly that day. So we're like, okay. He goes, now, I'll never forget his description. I loved him. He goes, now, he says, when you smell this, it's an anaerobe. It's a nasty anaerobe. He says, so when you smell this, like, this is what he said. It's going to smell like a dead cow that's been laying in the August sun for a month and you punctured its stomach. <sighs> I will never forget. That's what he said. And I'm looking at him like, could you come up with something a little more gross? You know, I mean, seriously. And I'm looking at him like, why would you be that way? And about that time, I'm in the back of this class, and about that time, a kid in the front of the class opened the test tube, and the whole class looked at him. It stunk. It was so nasty. And I hate to say this, but that's kind of what this room's going to spell like next week. Because anaerobes are stinky. Now, he does tell you that if you'd like, you can poke holes in your container and you can grow some aerobic bacteria. The problem is you're probably going to grow some anaerobes in there too just because you've got bacteria growing. So you want it to be in a place where nobody's going to smell it. You also want it to be in a place where nobody's going to knock it over because anything it knocks over on is going to stink forever. Okay, think skunk, but worse. So I just want a heads up. So anaerobic bacteria are the ones that are at the bottom of the swamp. They're the ones that are in the septic tank that smell so badly. You get my drift. Oh, you ever watched an old movie where uh, somebody in the movie ended up with gangrene? Mm -hmm. You ever seen a movie like that? And you ever notice that when they show somebody has gangrene, they like open the wound and then they go, <gasps> you know, like the smell's gonna knock them out. I don't know if you noticed that's what they're doing. The smell's gonna knock them out. It's an anaerobe. Again, green is an anaerobe. So when you wrap up a wound and leave it where there's no oxygen that can get to it, the gangrene can start growing. And then when you open it, the smell almost knocks you down because they're rotting, literally. Okay? And so haven't you ever noticed that your mom opens up the wound? She regularly changes, you know, a dressing if you, if you have a wound of some sort. Do you ever notice that mom, when you get a, a puncture wound, she pushes on the puncture wound? You know why? Tetanus is an anaerobe. You, you, you want that out of there. So mom makes it bleed to try to push any bacteria that might have gotten in there out because then there's less of a chance that the anaerobes can get in there and make you really sick. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. See, mom's not a vampire. She actually has a good reason. You're thinking, no, she's just sadistic. No, she's not. Trust me. All right. Um, and when you're in a... Uh, <laughs> In the micro department of any college, I, they used to have t-shirts that said, the microbes win in the end. And I always love that because they really do. Because when we all die, the bacteria eat us. <laughs> so the microbes win in the end. I always thought that one was funny. Um, OK. And then we're told about biosphere and how it was a disaster and it didn't work. And it's because they didn't take into account the microorganisms that actually keep the planet functioning. On page 44, the on your own, 2.4, can saprophytic bacteria be autotrophic? No. No, uh, no, because that's like a contradiction of terms, isn't it? Saprophytes live on dead material. Autotrophs make their own material. 2.5, can an aerobic bacterium be chemosynthetic? Yeah. yeah. It can require oxygen and still break down chemicals for its food, can it? Right? Okay. Then we get into reproduction. Asexual reproduction in a bacteria is called binary fission. And this is actually a, an electron micrograph. So it's using an electron microscope. It is not a light microscope. Our microscopes bounce light off of whatever the object is or bounce it through the object to our eyes. And that's how we see them. An electron microscope actually bounces electrons off of whatever it is and then back to a computer that tells you what it's supposed to look like. There's no color involved because there's no light involved and therefore they have to colorize it for us. So please don't think that any of these colors are correct. They've been made to look that way so that you can 
see them. Okay? Um, please look on page 45. It shows you how asexual reproduction of bacterium works. This is basically it dividing in two and cloning itself. There is no new genetic information, um, no variation whatsoever. So the bacteria DNA, the circle of DNA in the bacteria actually attaches itself to the plasma membrane. A copy is made of that and then the plasma membrane starts to elongate until it gets long enough that it can pinch off in between. Therefore, both of the daughter cells have a copy of the DNA and so they're clones of one another, aren't they? And like I said, it's also known as binary fission or asexual reproduction in bacteria. Um, okay. The bacteria, because they don't have any variation in their information, are limited so that if there's something environmental that the original strain can't handle, the whole population is going to be wiped out. And that's where these ways of getting uh, variations of DNA are helpful because then maybe the population can adapt because of a plasmid that might have some other information in it to help it to survive. You've already read about plasmids, so I can say that. We'll come back to that. Turn to page 46, please. On page 46, we're told that a bacteria can go from the time that it comes into being until the time it can go through binary fission or uh, asexual reproduction is only about 20 minutes. So that means that a generation for a bacteria is a average about 20 minutes. Now that means they are reproducing every 20 minutes and they reproduce logarithmically. In other words, one turns into two, turn, two turns into four, four turn into 16, don't they? No, eight. Uh, one turns into two, two turn into four. Yep, I go, it does go to eight. And then it goes to 16. And so, but it grows very quickly, doesn't it? And it's a logarithmic growth. It's not a linear growth rate. And so the trick is that when they have plenty of food around, they can reproduce in such a way that it tells you here on the top of page 46 that, let's see, you can have more than a billion bacteria in 10 hours. And if they continued unabated, in other words, they had food that they could continue reproducing for a whole week, their combined weight would be larger than the planet's weight. Think about that for a minute. Huh? I mean, that's a lot, isn't it? So thank God when they run out of food, they slow down. Yay, right? Yay. Um, and so it's very important. That's why mom wants you to clean the kitchen. You thought that it was because she was a clean freak. She's got other reasons going on here, <laughs> all right? Uh, so you want to take away their food supply. And when you take away their food supply, then they can't continue to reproduce like this. As a matter of fact, they'll get to where if the food supply's gone, they'll start eating each other and they'll start dying off, seriously. So on the bottom of the page, well, in the middle of the page, it gives you a definition for steady state. And it says steady state uh, is a state in which the members of the population die as quickly as new members are. I crossed off the word uh, born and put made. Bacteria are not born. Bacteria come into being, you could say made, but they're not born. Uh, having had children, we know they're not born. Okay, so what do we got here? Well, let's say we'll go back to the dead cow scenario. We used it anyway, what the heck. We got a dead cow. The bacteria go, whoo, dead cow, dead cow. And they have a bacteria party, right? And they start reproducing like crazy because they're breaking down this dead cow. They're saprophytic, you know, they're having a good old time. They're multiplying like crazy. And what happens? They start running out of dead cow. <laughs> and so when they start running out of dead cow, they have just as many bacteria coming into being as dying, and therefore they hit steady state. And that's the top of that graph where it just starts leveling out because you really aren't building any more bacteria. You're just keeping it level. Eventually, they're going to run out of dead cow. And when they run out of dead cow, then their numbers are really going to go down because there's not enough food to support them anymore. And so the only way that could jump back up again is if another cow dies, okay? Otherwise, it's gonna go down, thank God, if we remove the food source, then their population also dwindles, and that's a good thing. Okay, well, at least for us. Um, 
it tells on page 47 that exponential growth is when the population can grow unhindered because it's got all the food it needs. Whereas logistic growth is where the population is controlled by limited resources. So you need to know the difference there and say it in your own words, okay? As best you can, keep it short. So on page 47, the on your own, 2.6, it says a population of bacteria grown from a single starter bacterium is rather fragile. When conditions are changed, the population dies quickly. Based on what you have just learned, develop a hypothesis for why this is the case. Basically what it gets down to is when they go through asexual reproduction, there's no new possibilities of information and therefore if they're susceptible to let's say heat and then it heats up, they're dead. They're all dead because there's no new information. Okay, that's the idea. Um, or some of them can't handle light. Some of them can't handle light. I don't know if you know that that's an old cure. If you have like infantigo or something, um, infantigo being a skin uh, infection, they would take the scab off and put it to the light. It would kill the bacteria. And that's an old cure for that. So, because those bacteria can't be in the light, it kills them. Okay, 2.7. A population of bacteria, <laughs> dare I say, thus the brown glass for the experiment. Okay. Anyway, um, 2.7, a population of bacteria reaches a steady state and then after several days the population actually increases dramatically. <gasps> what could cause such an event? More food. Another dead cow, that's right. Okay, good job, good job. All right, so then we get into genetic recombination. Go ahead and turn to page 48. Now, this is not sexual reproduction. It is not sexual reproduction because you don't have two organisms actually making one new organism with the combination of DNA. But what you do have is genetic recombination where you can get new information genetically from another organism, which is pretty weird when you think about it. Um, seriously. Let's go to right to plasmid. A plasmid is a circle of DNA that's not the main DNA of the bacteria, and so you and I as Americans could think of it as an accessory. Okay? It's an accessory. Let's say you were getting a Ford pickup truck. Okay, well, the, the, the steering wheel and the windows and the windshield and the tires, that's all standard stuff, right? That would be in the regular DNA for the bacteria. But let's say you wanted to get an AM, FM, you know, CD player or whatever they do now, or with a GPS, that would be an accessory, wouldn't it? And so that would be special. Well, in a bacteria, that would be a little separate piece of DNA called a plasmid. It's a little circle of DNA that's not necessary to its survival, but it might be helpful for its survival if it can help it through bad situations because it's an accessory piece of DNA. Does that make sense to everybody? Maybe I should have used jewelry. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, accessories. Think accessories. Okay. I was trying to get where the boys can understand it too, though, and if I use jewelry, we're going to totally lose the guys. So, uh, Should we go with guns and scopes? I don't know. Okay. There you go. I'll get it. I'll get it. So accessories. Now, um, one of the ways to, for a bacterium to share a plasmid that might benefit another bacteria is through conjugation. And there's a picture of that there where the bacteria will use its fimbria, fimbria to grab the bacteria next to it. It will take that plasmid of DNA, and DNA is a, uh, it's a spiral helix molecule. In other words, DNA looks like a rope ladder that's been twisted. So if you have a rope ladder that's been twisted, that's what the DNA molecule looks like. You took your rope ladder and you twisted it. Okay? So what that means is that you could split this, would be like splitting that, and send half to the other guy. That's what's happening. So it grabs hold of the guy next to it, grabs hold of the guy next to it, makes a conjugation tube, splits that circle of DNA in half, sends half to the other guy. This, this is a, a code. So whatever's on this side, we know what goes on this side because it's coded. And so they can reproduce the other half. As long as they have half, they can reproduce the other half and then they have all the information. And then it lets go of the other guy and they both have a copy of the plasmid. They both have a copy of the new accessory information. Now that accessory information could be a bacteria that 
before couldn't handle sunlight can now handle sunlight. So if all of a sudden something happens in their cave and there's light, some of the population will die, but any of the population that has a new plasmid will survive to reproduce. Does that make sense to everybody? So it, it could help with survival, and that's where plasmids can come in handy. Um, so he's got an example there on page 49. A population of bacteria are living in a lake. Due to volcanic activity nearby, the lake's temperature begins to increase. In the population, there are some bacteria that are resistant to low temperatures, call them type A, and another type that are resistant to high temperatures, call them type B. Which type will be the donor and which the recipient of the population begins to conjugate? In other words, who's going to give information to whom? Type B to type B. <clears throat> right. The ones that are heat resistant are going to give the plasmid to the non-heat resistant ones so that they can hopefully survive. So they'll be the donor and the other ones will be the recipient. So far so good? Everything making sense? Yeah. Okay. Then we get to the really confusing stuff. Transformation and transduction. This is going to be a, it's, it's all good. No problem. Transformation, it tells us the transfer of a DNA segment from a non-functional donor cell to that of a functional recipient cell. A non-functional donor cell is dead. Okay. So transformation is a salvage operation. It's a salvage job. You know, if a ship was dead and it was on the bottom or sinking and you went and took parts off of it to help yourself, that's salvaging, right? That's what transformation is. Now, I want to tell you something. It's not just bacteria that do this. They now know in eukaryotic cells, we have something called apoptosis or apoptosis. Our cells, when they're ready, when they die, they break apart and other cells will pick up pieces and reuse them and recycle them. And actually certain disease states are caused when apoptosis doesn't work correctly and those things are not reused. Isn't that interesting? So this is not just in bacteria. I want you to know this. This is actually, you'll see this in other cells. But you don't need to know that. I just wanted you to know that. Okay, so that was transformation. You can say transformation, salvage job. As long as you know that means that the bacteria is grabbing parts from a dead bacteria. But you can just write salvage job so that you can jolt that information in your mind. Okay? Uh, the next one on the next page is transduction. Now, transduction is a little iffier. Transduction is when a virus is involved. There we go. There's the virus. That's a virus. Doesn't it look like it's a bacteriophage? It, it, it kind of looks like a little lunar lander, doesn't it? Okay, but that's really what bacteriophages are, look like. What a virus will do, I know because he didn't explain this because he said we'll cover it later, but I hate to leave you there, so let's, let's do it real quickly. What a virus does, including in our cells, is it lands on the cell and it injects its DNA or RNA, its genetic material, into the host cell. It will then take over the DNA of the host cell. It makes the host cell produce a whole bunch of little viruses, and then it kills the host cell and spreads all the little viruses to do it again. We'll talk about them more later, but that's generally how viruses work. So when a bacteriophage, which is actually a bacterial virus, uh, does this to a bacteria, and it injects its DNA in, and then when it destroys the cell, its DNA becomes a part. But look, we have these viruses. Some of them have bacterial DNA or, or RNA, but some of them have the original bacteria's pieces of DNA. Then when it's injected into a new cell, you could actually have bacteria from, uh, DNA from another bacteria injected into the cell. And that's one way that you can get DNA from one bacteria to another. It's by a virus being involved. And so that's really all your book says, is this is a process in which infection of a virus results in DNA being transferred from one bacteria to another. But that's what's happening, is that the, the, back, the virus itself is actually transferring the bacteria. The next thing we have is endospores. Endospores are when the bacteria find themselves in a bad situation, they have to cover their internal uh, DNA so that when the cell dies, it itself doesn't die, so that when the conditions get better, then it can rejuvenate itself. Like when we heard about them boiling some of those bacteria, but then they survived the boiling. They apparently made endospores, and they had to be boiled longer to get rid of them. This is an actual micrograph of an endospore. Notice how it's on the interior of the cell. It's just in the, in the plasma and membrane. It's just around the genetic material and a little bit of cytoplasm, so that when the conditions get right again, it can 
can start over again. It's listed under reproduction, but it's really not a form of reproduction. It's a form of survival. I just want you to know that. And then it talks about bacterial colonies. And what you need to know is if it's a colony, the colonies are only make the shape of what is already in their DNA. So they don't get together and go, hey, what do you say? Let's make a line. It doesn't work that way, okay? Their DNA will tell them what kind of colony to make. And that's why doctors and microbiologists can look at the DNA, excuse me, look at the colonies and tell you what kind of bacteria it is because they classically make these different colonies. So notice Diplococcus gets together in twos. Tetracoccus gets together in fours. Streptococcus, and you've heard of that before, gets together in lines. Okay, Staphylococcus, you've heard of Staph before, it makes that weird shape. Okay, so you, you see how what part do you need to know of that? You need to know that the bacteria only make colonies that their DNA codes for. You also need to know that if it ends with the word bacillus, they're bat shaped. If it ends with the word coccus or coxy, they're circle shaped. That's the part you need to know, okay? So that's just showing you um, these are colonies of some type of uh, coxy. That's a colony of bacilli. That's a pneumonia bacilli, okay? Uh, and those are, oh, that's blue-green algae. And those are actually spirilla colonies where these big long filaments are made up of multiple cells that are just colonized. Now once again, in a colony you can separate them and they can survive alone. It's not like when you take a skin cell and say, here it is, no, we're multicellular, it'll die without us, right? But in a colony you can break them apart and they can survive on their own. So that's that difference. Okay, the next part real quickly. So at the bottom of page 51 where it says a bacterial colony is called Staphylobacillus, what shape are they? You tell me. Bacillus, what shape are they? They're rod shaped, thank you. Turn over to page 53, please. You're told that they gram stain things and when they gram stain things, they're able to determine uh, something about the bacteria. I wanted to show you what a gram stain is. When you put a drop of a bacteria on a slide, you flame the slide so you don't burn the top where the bacteria are. You flame underneath it so that it fixes the bacteria to the slide. Then what they do is they put drops of methyl violet, which will turn your hands blue, I'm just going to tell you from experience, okay, and then you would, you know, just rinse that off, and then you put iodine on the slide, and you'd rinse that off, then you take the whole slide and you dip it in alcohol, and then you go ahead and you put on the last uh, dye, which is red. Now the trick is this, gram-positive bacteria will pick up this dye. These two combined will actually attach themselves to certain structures in the, um, the bacteria that are gram positive and make them appear blue. When they wash this with alcohol, any gram negative bacteria, this will wash away the blue stain so that they look clear again. So the way they wanna do them so that you can see that they're clear is they'll put this red stain on and then the bacteria will look red and then you'll know that those are gram negative because they didn't pick up the gram uh, stain. Does that make sense? So it's gram positive, it picked these up. If it's gram negative, it didn't pick it up, therefore it'll look red. And so that was shown in your book and so you can see that the red ones are gram negative and the blue ones are gram positive. This would be how this would be determined. Now, they, even before they knew all that, they figured out that they could use that information to do a classification system. And so, if you'll look on page 55, table 2.1, you see that if something is gram negative, it's put in phylum gracilla cutis. If it's gram positive, it's put in phylum firmicutes. And then there are some bacteria that don't have cell walls at all, because both of those do, and then it's put in tenera cutis, that phylum. And then if it has exotic cell walls, so it can live someplace like way up in the atmosphere or at the, the center of a nuclear reactor or someplace strange, then they put it in Mendoza. Okay, you're supposed to know that. So first, they're, they're actually separated by whether they gram stain positive or negative, whether they have a cell wall or whether they have an exotic cell wall. From there, I want you to look at Gracilla cutis. Then they're classified by what type of metabolism they have. So if they don't photosynthesize, they're scotobacteria. If they do photosynthesize, they're going to be one of these other two. If they make oxygen when they photosynthesize, they're oxyphotobacteria. If they don't make oxygen when they photosynthesize, you put an A in front of it and it's anoxyphotobacteria. 
Okay, so they kind of tell you what they are. In firmicutes, they're totally classified by their shape. If they're bacilli or cocci, they're in firmibacteria. If they're any other shape, they're in thallobacteria. And then there's only one classification in those other two. So, oh yeah? So, I just wanted to show you some of these shapes. You have flagellated bacteria, you have sporilla. Okay, now let's do what we have to do. What you need to do is find some scummy water. You're gonna get a ladle. Don't fall in. Please watch for moccasins. Okay, you're going, hey, uh, old pools or, or uh, fountains that are green, they're good, okay? Water troughs that are nasty, okay. Get a little sample, then you're gonna put, it tells you that you're gonna put like egg yolk in there or white rice. Most of you don't have hay available to you, so use a little grass. Make sure you get a little dirt in at least one of them. You're supposed to have four. Do not bring in here large jars next week. These should be baby food jars or smaller. I mean, this is as big as anything I should see because you're gonna need one drop out of it, okay? If they are clear jars, cover them with aluminum foil, okay, because you don't want to kill everything with the light. You want to put them someplace where they are not going to get knocked over and make everything stink. If you want to put holes in them, you can because then you'll actually get more life in there, okay? Um, you're gonna set this up in the next two or three days, please, so that it has time to grow your bacterial culture. Put it in a box or a Tupperware container so you make sure it comes and that it doesn't get knocked over. And they need to come in here next week. If you're here at heat all day, I want you to come in the building and you stick them all by the back of the room. Just stick them right along there at the back of the room and I'll tell the moms to stay away. They'll probably smell it and stay away anyway, okay? <laughs> but you don't need to carry them around. You do need to bring them. You two can work together. You don't have to you know, do separate ones, all right? You, you and your brother can work together. So if you've got a, you two, work together. If you've got a buddy in here and one of you decides you can get scummy water better than the other, and we don't need everybody to bring one. Some of the best ones I've ever seen came off golf courses. If you live near a golf course, find the scummiest little water source you can in a golf course and get a sample. I have seen some of the coolest flagellated spirilla off of golf course that I've ever seen anywhere. Really cool stuff. I don't know what they're using, but man, there's some cool stuff in the golf course. So be, you know, use your imaginations, okay? And find them, but do it soon because we really need these samples to be set up and fed and don't get them knocked over and warn your family so they don't break them and it stinks up the whole house. All right? See you next week. <laughs>